how do you think the awareness uh, of the public is growing or fading already since 2013, since your actions? Yeah, I mean, it's natural uh, for these things to sort of fade. Uh, people don't remember exactly what happened. Uh, many people didn't see the original stories at all. Uh, when we go through uh, the kind of things that were demonstrated in 2013, uh, many of you have probably heard of the PRISM program. You've seen it in the film. Uh, you know the largest internet companies uh, in the world uh, voluntarily joined this program. You may have also heard about upstream communications, where rather than going to the internet companies themselves, they went to the phone companies. They went to sort of these fiber optic networks that tie the European continent uh, to the American continent and instead just listen to everything. But you might not have heard of other programs uh, where the NSA was spying on the pornography viewing habits uh, of individuals that they considered to have radical political beliefs. Uh, these were Islamists, uh, to be fair, but these were individuals that the NSA's own top secret documents said they did not suspect of violence and they did not suspect to be actually tied to uh, terrorist activity. They just didn't like their politics. The United Kingdom uh, was collecting images uh, from people's webcams. If you happen to use Yahoo Messenger uh, some years ago when that was a popular thing, uh, the camera that was in your bedroom, they were collecting an image from every five minutes and they were storing it permanently. In Australia, uh, the same infrastructure that the United States government had built, the technology that we had developed and shared, they were using to identify uh, the sources of journalists who had written reports that they considered critical. Programs that had been justified on the basis of uh, national security that they said were going to be used strictly for counterterrorism purposes had instead been used to target U.S. lawyers, which is actually a violation of law, uh, and not because they thought these lawyers had some special intelligence that would save lives, but rather because they were negotiating a trade deal with Indonesia over the price of shrimp and clove cigarettes. These things will fade, but there is one thing that we should remember. When we look at the investigation into the effectiveness of these programs, the U.S. government's own staff, right? These are not uh, sort of liberal reformers. These are not people who want to see an open society. The, this board was comprised of individuals such as the former deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, Michael Morell. And they found that this kind of mass surveillance that had been justified on the basis of countering terrorism had actually never been useful in that context. It had never stopped a single terrorist plot, and it had never made, and this is the government's words, uh, a quote, a concrete difference in the outcome of any terrorism investigation. These programs were never about terrorism. Uh, they were about economic espionage, they were about diplomatic manipulation, they were about social influence, they're about power. And that's what espionage has always been about. Countering terrorism is not an intelligence activity in the traditional sense. That is a police activity. And when we hear people, when we hear spies, when we hear politicians saying, give up your rights uh, to allow us to create these intelligence infrastructures of extraordinary powers because terrorists exist in the world, uh, you should remember that there have always been terrorists in the past. We have always been able to counter them effectively. Uh, and we did this through the traditional means of police work and investigation that have always been effective in the past. Why are we proposing to throw away all of the rights that people fought and died to establish over centuries of human civilization uh, for programs that even the U.S. government says were never effective? Okay. You say mass surveillance is not productive for, 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 for um, attacking terrorist attacks. Um, but there, in, in, intelligence uh, services need some information, a lot of information, to protect the people, they say, and we believe. So what kind of information and, and, and what kind of programs uh, need intelligence services to protect us from bombings like in Boston, like in Paris, like in, uh, in Brussels? If, uh, if, if mass surveillance question. is not appropriate. 
Yeah, this is an excellent question because when we look at the Boston Marathon bombings, for example, uh, this was during the height of American mass surveillance. This was before anybody knew it existed, before it had hit the newspapers. Uh, and they were collecting the phone calls of everyone. They were collecting the Internet activities of, uh, you know, uh, people indiscriminately just in case they were useful. And it did not stop this attack. And it did not stop this attack even though we had been specifically warned by foreign intelligence services uh, that these individuals were associated with terrorism. Uh, much the same in Brussels. Uh, now, we had known about mass surveillance in a broad sense here. Uh, but in the Brussels attacks, uh, Belgium had been warned uh, by the Turks in this case uh, that some of these individuals were associated with terrorism. So it begs the question, why did mass surveillance fail to catch these individuals? It's not because uh, they used encryption. It's not because they were particularly skillful. It's not because they were just so clever. It's because when you collect everything, the communications of everyone in a nation, you understand nothing. You get drowned in so much information that you can't find what's actually relevant. Uh, if you use traditional means of investigation, uh, gathering indicators, tips from, for example, these foreign intelligence services, uh, you take them to a court, you go to a judge, you say, look, we have some evidence. This person has ties to terrorism. We would like a warrant for our police to sneak into their homes, to place a camera, to tap a phone, to follow them as they go through their activities in the day, as we always have uh, for, you know, uh, decades at this point. Uh, you can watch specifically the individuals uh, who exhibit indications of actually threatening behavior, and then you can catch them in the act. And these are the cases where we have seen it happen. Uh, in recent Canadian attacks that, we, that have been thwarted, it was not due to mass surveillance, uh, but it was because of the fact that they watched specifically the individuals who they had been tipped off did have these activities, often by members of their family or by their communities, and they watched them. And then when suddenly they collect weapons, they call a taxi cab, and they try to go to a train station, the police are already there ready to make the arrest uh, and ready to thwart the attack, and it actually works. The distinction that I want to put make here uh, in simple terms, because I know that's a little bit broad, is what people in civil society, what I protest most strongly is mass surveillance, indiscriminate surveillance where they're watching everyone, targeted surveillance uh, that's backed by a court uh, where police have shown, look, this individual is more likely than not to be a criminal we're asking for uh, a warrant to investigate their activities for a period of time uh, in a very intrusive way, but in a very targeted way. We're only watching this individual. We know it is effective because it has been in the past. Uh, and we know that this is the least intrusive means of achieving these investigative goals without destroying the rights of everyone else in a free society. So you say mass surveillance is, isn't necessary for, for uh, counter-terror attacks. That's correct. But let's presume it were. Let's presume it were effective. Uh, would we want it anyway? The challenge here is if we create a, a government that is so powerful a structure that uh, is so omniscient, it knows everything that everyone's doing at every time, it can enforce the law perfectly. No one can steal a loaf of bread, no one can speed, no one can commit a terrorist act, no one can murder. Uh, you know, a lot of people would say that's fabulous, it's the end of crime, and it's true. But that may not be as unmitigated a good as it seems at first glance. Because when we think about social progress, uh, when we think about the advance of human rights, when we think about the abolition of slavery, when we think about marriage equality, when we think about the prohibition uh, of uh, you know, drugs or certain kinds of alcohol in the past, prohibition of certain types of religious worship, all of these movements were criminal activities in the beginning. Even if it's uh, the enfranchisement of women allowing them to vote, uh, if government simply says, the laws on the books can be enforced, and they will be enforced, and we will use the full extent of our powers to ensure that is the case. What they're doing is they're halting progress at this moment in time and saying, we have gone far enough, 
And no one can transgress against the status quo even for a good reason. No one can organize to change the law if to do so, they have to love someone in a way that's not approved. They have to worship in a way that's not popular. They have to do any activity that has not been explicitly authorized in advance by the government. I do not see that as a bright future. In fact, I see it as a very dark one.